All right, just for fun, let's fry this guard from the shadows like a real vampire. And they're gone. <laughs> Hello, my friends, and welcome back to another Baldur's Gate 3 build guide. Hope you're all doing well. Today, we're covering a build I'm calling the True Vampire, because it allows Astarian to hide in the shadows and suck the life out of your enemies, a phrase I'm sure we can all be very mature about in the comments. This build centers around Astarian's lore, but it's of course also very viable for main characters, and while it is built on a specific gimmick. I think this is actually an incredibly strong build for honor mode. It's actually way better than I thought it would be when I started building it, to be honest. The numbers actually uh, work out really well, and so this is one that I'm really excited to share with you. This build is also, I think, very friendly to Astarian's lore, because he, when we meet him, is obsessed with arcane power and searching for a way to uh, overcome his backstory, of course, and this imagines an Astarian obsessed with arcane power who has gone to slightly stranger and more dangerous places than we see him when we when we meet him first in-game, but still well within the scope of what the character intends to do. This build not only does tons of damage, but also provides a ton of self-healing, making your character uh, both a powerful damage dealer as well as a reasonable tank, and a fully functional and powerful spellcaster in its own right. So this build actually gets to do a lot of different things. Let's jump in and start building. If you're building this for a main character, then first off, I recommend taking Lightfoot Halfling or Dwergar as your race, because this build is going to use stealth checks uh, in order to be the hidden menace from the shadows that it wants to be, and both of those races have significant synergy there. Lightfoot Halfling gets advantage, as well as can't re-roll ones, or can't roll ones, and um, Dwergar can turn invisible at will, which of course is very powerful with a stealth build. For Astarian, we are going to start with a level in Sorcerer. This build is going to use a specific multi-class combo, and so when we start with Sorcerer, that gets us two things. One, it gets us a bunch of dialogue skills, which will allow us to act as the party face if we so desire, and of course, for a lore-friendly Astarian build, it's kind of nice if he can have, be the charming character that he's made out to be in-game. Um, and it also gets us constitution save proficiency, which will allow us to maintain concentration on any spells we're concentrating on for longer. Um, generally speaking, when you're doing a multi-class caster build involving sorcerer, you want to take sorcerer as your level one class. This build, because it uses a specific multi-class combo, is going to come online uh, somewhere around level three, so I recommend respecking into it rather than starting from level one, but you can play it from level one if you want. For our Sorcerer subclass, we are going to go with Wild Magic. The reason for this is the Tides of Chaos ability, which allows us to gain advantage on our next attack roll. The core combo of this build is going to involve making attack rolls, so having at-will advantage on them is going to be extremely powerful, and so this actually lets us get a, a significant benefit. If This isn't critical, so if you are afraid of the wild magic surges, which are fairly dangerous on an honor mode run, although also very funny, uh, you can go with the uh, other two sorcery bloodlines if you want. You could take uh, Draconic Bloodline is probably the simplest one, in which case you would take most likely White Dragon Ancestry, because Armor of Agathis is really good, and will combo reasonably well with your healing to provide more tanking abilities. But Wild Magic Sorcerer gets no play and has a lot of synergy with this character, so it's fun to be able to use that. For our ability selection, we are going to take a rather unusual split for a sorcerer. Um, we are going to go with 16 Wisdom, 16 Constitution, of course, because you should always take 16 Constitution on almost every character, 14 Dexterity for AC and Armor class, and then only 12 Charisma. The reason for this is that our combat abilities are actually going to come from levels in Cleric rather than levels in Sorcerer. We'll be using Sorcerer for utility spells, so we don't need very high Charisma except for dialogue checks. In fact, if you aren't using this as a main character or aren't using this as a party face, you can even drop Charisma all the way to 8 without any significant harm to the character, in which case you could take 17 Wisdom to potentially use Ethel's hair, or even 17 Wisdom and 15 Dexterity to boost both of those to 16 with an ASI. For our spell selection, remember we are not using Sorcerer as our main form of attack, of attacking character, so we're going to take only um, utility spells on our Sorcerer levels, getting 
damage and attacking spells, damage and control spells from our levels in Cleric later on. For that reason, we're going to take Mage Hand, Minor Illusion, and Blade Ward, because these are all powerful utility spells that can give us a huge advantage. And then if you're doing dialogue skills, you should take Friends, because this will uh, uh, enable you to pass dialogue checks more readily, especially against characters you're going to fight anyways. And if you aren't doing that, you should take True Strike to annoy people in the comments. Finally, um, for our spell selection, of course we want to start with shield, it's critically important, and magic missile is still very good on your sorcerer levels because it doesn't require you to have good charisma to use at all, it, the damage isn't based on your stats, and the um, and there's no hit chance, so you don't need high charisma at, at all in order to use magic missile. At character level 2, we get to take our second class. And quick pop quiz for everyone, what is the highest damage level 1 spell in the game? The answer is Inflict Wounds. Inflict Wounds does 3d10 of necrotic damage for an average damage of 16 and a half, but importantly it's an attack roll, so if you critically hit it's going to deal 6d10 of necrotic damage. At level 2 that's going to one-shot basically everything in the entire game. However, the issue with this spell, of course, is that it's melee only. So, the reason that we want to take Sorcerer levels is that with Distant Spell and Quicken Spell, we can cast Inflict Wounds, one of the highest damage possible actions in the game, at, as a bonus action and at range, multiple times per turn later on in the game. This will allow us to, while remaining hidden in the shadows, thanks to a combo that we're going to see later on, consistently apply one of the highest damage actions in the game. Upcasted Inflict Wounds also gains uh, benefits extremely well from upcasting, gaining an extra d10 of damage every single level. So as you cast it with higher level spell slots, it will stay quite relevant later on into the game. So we're going to take a level of Cleric to get us access to Inflict Wounds, as well as our other offensive options for this character. And one thing to note is that while this character does use this gimmick to do most of its damage, it still just has all of the powerful spell casting of Sorcerers and Clerics and even more later on, um, and so while it has access to this gimmick, it's not forced to use it. You can still just cast all of the normally extremely powerful cleric options as well. This is something that sometimes causes confusion around these builds that are centered around a certain combo, so I thought I'd emphasize that right away. For our domain, we're going to select Knowledge Domain, because this character wants to be in stealth frequently, but doesn't get stealth proficiency from levels. So with knowledge domain at second level of knowledge cleric, we're going to be able to take our knowledge domain action to gain proficiency in all of the dexterity skills, giving us stealth, sleight of hand, and acrobatics proficiency from our cleric levels, and not having to take a class level that gives them to us. This will allow us to make the important stealth checks that we're going to need to make later on. For our levels here, for our cantrips here, we're going to take all the powerful cleric cantrips that you know and love. You need resistance and guidance on almost every character, but remember this is a uh, this is also a dialogue character if you want it to be. So you can take thaumaturgy for advantage on intimidation and performance checks as well, which you can pick up from your uh, intimidation. You can pick up from your sorcerer levels, and that will give you a significant bonus to your dialogue checks. Um, in addition to your reasonable plus one persuasion bonus. This isn't going to be breaking the bank on dialogue skills, but this will be a totally reasonable party face because you have thaumaturgy and friends from your class levels and get proficiency in some uh, in persuasion and other charisma skills, as well as giving you advantage on the other charisma skills from thaumaturgy and friends. For our... Spell selection, our typical prepared spells, you are always going to have command prepared, which is great, because that's the best thing for clerics to have. And of course we need inflict wounds, because that's our core damage combo. You should also always have healing ward. Since we will be able to make ranged attacks with inflict wounds, at this level we might want guiding bolt, but we won't need it next level, so we won't prepare it. But bless is going to be really good. Good thing to concentrate on, and it will increase the likelihood of hitting with inflict wounds. Notice also, because inflict wounds is an attack roll, the fact that we're doing this with a Starion is pretty nice because he gets plus one on all his attack rolls thanks to the happy buff so he's going to hit more often with inflict wounds as well especially given the advantage from wild magic sorcerer. Finally you're going to want sanctuary just because it's a great panic button on honor mode and very important for this character you can use it to get into position or run away if you've tried to vampirize someone and they uh, not actually managed to kill them and they became unhappy with you. 
Finally, you also get expertise in a couple knowledge skills, which is actually great if you are the character's the party's face, because the character that's doing all your dialogues is the most likely to have to roll these checks. Arcana and history are the ones that come up the most anyways, so just leave these where they are. At character level 3, um, we could take a second level of Cleric to get knowledge of the ages, but I think it's more important to go back and grab our second Sorcerer level to uh, get access to our meta magic because it's very important that we have Distant Spell so we can start hitting things with Inflict Wounds from far away. Uh, twin Spell will also allow us to hit two creatures at once with Inflict Wounds, um, which is, of course, doubling the ex already extremely high damage of casting this at long range. This will allow your character to suddenly be doing massive damage spikes um, from 30 feet away. So it's not the longest ranged attack, but still very nice because it turns that melee attack into a 30 foot ranged attack with distant spell. For our other sorcerer spells, you're just generally going to want to take utility spells on sorcerer. You can take disguise self if you're doing um, if you're doing party face stuff if you're doing dialogue stuff but if you aren't doing dialogue stuff then you can take something like fog cloud which you can hide inside using the hide action to make sure that you're perfectly hidden uh, as well as blinding enemies you can also just take expeditious retreat or something like that At the next character level, we're going to take another level of sorcerer so that we can get access to quicken spell and level 2 spells. This will make sure that we're not falling too far behind on the spell curve. Um, and so, and we don't need stealth proficiency until later on in the game, so it's not that important that we take our second cleric level yet. So we're going to be gaining more sorcerer points as well as additional spell selection from taking another level of sorcerer. Sorcerer, notice, has some more damage spells that are really strong for... Uh, Characters even that have invested very little in charisma, like Cloud of Daggers, which you can maintain concentration on. This doesn't use your charisma at all, because there's no hit roll or saving throw for Cloud of Daggers, so you can pick that up. Um, and then, of course, you can replace a spell as well. So uh, we'll probably replace Fog Cloud or whatever we picked here with another utility spell. In this case, Misty Step. Very important that every character have Misty Step. And, of course, the... 100% of the time, uh, unless you're doing something extremely weird, you're going to take Quicken Spell as your level 3 meta magic. This will allow you to make bonus action, inflict wounds attacks, or uh, add and inflict wounds on top of a cloud of daggers or something along those lines, giving you a tremendous amount of additional action economy, an extremely powerful effect that lets you output massive damage. At character level 5, we're actually going to dip into a yet a third class, and that third class is Wizard. Wizard gives you not only the ability to learn uh, wizard spells from scrolls, so you can now learn, because we have five total caster levels, five total levels in caster classes, you can now learn wizard spells up to level 3 wizard spells. Now, we have... Uh, terrible intelligence, so we won't have that many spells prepared and they'll have bad DCs, but alongside the circlet of intelligence we'll be able to prepare and cast up to four wizard spells at this level, so we'll want to pick up the, the warped headband of intelligence. Um, and of course, just like with our sorcerer levels, we can make sure that we're learning mostly utility spells from scrolls, so we are going to be picking up uh, wizard spells that have high utility that we don't have access to otherwise, things like long strider, uh, Featherfall, False Life, and so on that we don't currently have access to but want to be able to prepare regularly. Of course, this is going to depend, what you select here is going to depend somewhat on what scrolls you have found up to this point, so it's going to change a little bit based on that. Notice also how many great utility spells there are at level 1. So even without duplicating, even though we've taken a bunch of Sorcerer and Wizard levels, we've still been able to pick up just a ton of powerful utility spells. Um, and of course we now, thanks to our Wizard levels, have access to all the great utility spells at level 2 and 3. As we continue to level up, we are going to want to make sure that we are continuing to actually hit our attack. So even with all of Astarian's bonuses and the, the advantages and everything, we still probably want to increase our wisdom to make sure that we're landing our attacks. So we're just going to take another level of Sorcerer, grab a feat, and take an ability improvement to wisdom. This is going to just make sure that we, our attacks are landing, and as well as increasing the save DC for command, which is going to be an incredibly important component of this character's uh, 
core gameplay style. And so having command to cause enemies to skip turns alongside a very potent ranged damage combo with inflict wounds is extremely useful. For our additional cantrip, again, just a utility cantrip that we don't have yet, and for our spells, similarly, we want another uh, spell that we don't have yet, bearing in mind that we are looking for ones that we haven't found from wizard scrolls. So this spell is going to depend significantly on whether we found this spell from a wizard scroll already or not. You can take a defensive spell like Blur or something like Invisibility. It doesn't, uh, it, this, like I said, it's going to depend a lot on whether you have found these spells from a wizard scroll. At character level 7, we get to take our second level in Cleric, just in time, oops, just in time to hit uh, character level 7 and be able to learn Greater Invisibility from a Wizard Scroll. So keep an eye out for a scroll of Greater Invisibility so that you can learn it. Since we're now a 7th level character, we have access to 4th level spells, so we can learn Greater Invisibility, and then we can use our Knowledge of the Ages to gain proficiency in Dexterity skills, giving us proficiency on Stealth checks so that we can make the Greater Invisibility checks. When you have have greater invisibility active and make an attack, such as a ranged inflict wounds, then your character has to make a stealth check in order to stay hidden. So having access to stealth proficiency gives us a significant bonus. Also, if you get pass without trace from an ally, then you can make this uh, you can stack this immensely. Of course, any stealth gear that you have allows you to raise this even higher, allowing you to make these inflict wounds attacks from stealth without alerting enemies completely because you have greater invisibility, self-cast, and are uh, therefore unable to be seen by the enemies. They won't react at all, but I like this a little more, honestly, from a, a just a sense perspective or like not exploiting the game perspective than doing this with arrows because at least it's costing you the spell slot to cast the inflict wounds for now we'll change that later um so it's not like you're just uh hitting the enemies for 20 minutes for free with arrows which i find gets pretty boring this way at least you are sucking the life out of them from the shadows which feels to me much more vampiric at this level the real power of the vampire comes online. We are going to take our second level of wizard and take the necromancy wizard school, because what is an interesting thing about inflict wounds as a as our main source of damage, well, it's a necromancy spell. And so it works with the grim harvest feature of the necromancer wizard to give us triple our spell slot level in hit points back every time we kill an enemy. We're regularly going to be one-shotting enemies because we'll be getting regular critical hits with Inflict Wounds, which will one-shot enemies. So any damage we've taken will very quickly be healed back up by the Grim Harvest feature of the Necromancer Wizard. This works based on the spell slot you actually use to cast. So if we are at this level using a 4th level spell slot to cast a 4th level Inflict Wounds, it's going to be 12 healing. That doesn't sound like a lot, but we're getting it for free basically every single turn. So that's going to give us a lot of hit points back over the course of the game. For our spell selection from Wizard, again, you're just going to take ones that you haven't found from scrolls, so just pick things, basically uh, anything that you haven't found from a scroll and think you might want. Character level 9, we are going to go back into Sorcerer, and I realize this is a fairly complicated leveling order, but there's a lot of reasons for this. And the reason for this is it gives us another... Um, gives us another sorcery point, which is very important, but also Sorcerer level 5 lets us get access to a spell we cannot get from a scroll, and that scroll that spell is Counterspell. There are no scrolls of Counterspell in the game, and it's one of the most important defensive reactions in the game, so it's really worth getting to Sorcerer or Wizard 5 to pick up Counterspell, and this way Astarian can provide that while also dishing out tons of damage and control effects from the Cleric levels. Obviously Counterspell... Um, you need to use a high level spell slot, but you only have to make an ability check if you use a spell slot that is lower level than the spell the enemy is trying to cast. So it doesn't matter that it's based off of charisma, you just use the appropriate level spell and you'll counter it 100% of the time. For our second spell, again, a utility spell that we haven't found from, if you want to replace a spell, utility spell that you haven't found from wizard. At this next level, we get to go back into Cleric, 
And the reason for this is that now we can take Hold Person, which will allow us to guarantee critical hits with our Inflict Wound spells. You can cast Hold Person and then quicken a an Inflict Wounds for a guaranteed critical hit, dealing massive burst damage and paralyzing an enemy, provided that you can land the, inflict, the Hold Person DC. This gets around one of the problems of Hold Person, because if you're damaging them on the same turn that you're casting the Hold Person, then you don't have to worry about having the right initiative for your ally to do that, or them getting to break out of it at the beginning of their turn. So you don't have to worry about hold person landing other than just the initial save in order to get the guaranteed critical hit. So it's incredibly strong to pick up hold person and to pick up and be able to prepare hold person at this level. We also get spiritual weapon, which is still relevant even this late in the game, or aid, things like that. Uh, just a lot of, or even enhance ability to make your stealth checks with advantage if you aren't don't have that from some other source. Um, all of those are pretty nice, though since you'll be casting your own greater invisibilities, you can't use enhance ability on yourself, usually. Take another cleric level to max out our wisdom so that we are more likely to hit and more likely to land our spells, always very important. And we get another cantrip so we can take light or something like that if we haven't picked that up somewhere else in this build since you get 900 cantrips with this build. And then finally, with our last level of um, of Cleric, we get Cleric level 3 spells, which include things like Spirit Guardians, Glyph of Warding, and so on, which are all also very powerful um, and just really nice to have as a backup option, assuming that your enemies are potentially resistant to necrotic damage, which does happen uh, a fair amount at this point in the game. Though I should emphasize again that you're not solely reliant on this combo, it's just one that you can use and it's very strong, but if you are facing necrotic resistant enemies in Act 2 and so on, then you can pick up, uh, you, you can choose to prepare and cast different spells against those enemies. You could change this leveling order significantly, and it's possible that if you're playing this build from start to finish, you'll want to respec to emphasize different things at different points. Like maybe you want to get Spirit Guardians earlier in Act 2, then respec back to, to be using the Inflict Wounds combo later on in Act 3. But the amount of healing that you're going to be receiving at this point is extremely powerful, and the amount of damage you'll be dishing out is incredible, especially when you're doing guaranteed crits with hold person or with luck of the far realms or any other way to guarantee crits like the um, killer's sweetheart and so on. Remember you're doing attack rolls when you make inflict wounds so you're likely to critically hit so critical hit gear is also very powerful. Speaking of gear there's a few pieces of gear that really take this build to the next level. The first and most important of course is the headband of intellect. Um, this is a build that probably does need this so you likely will not want to be grabbing this from another character or using this alongside another build that needs it. Luckily there aren't that many other builds that n actually need it but this one really does not want to invest in intelligence and so um, getting this will allow you to prepare more wizard spells. Uh, also, any gear that improves critical hits, like the uh, Shade Slayer Cloak or whatever, um, Knife of the Undermountain King, that's going to make your your Inflict Wounds more likely to critically hit without a guarantee, and that is, of course, extremely powerful. When you're doubling an enormous amount of damage, like a an upcasted Inflict Wounds, that's 8d10 of damage. 16d10 of damage is really, really powerful um, and will kill most enemies in a single shot, especially if you can do it multiple times per turn. Obviously, the 6th level spell you can't, unless you have the Staff of Cherished Necromancy, a staff that you get in Act 3, which is currently bugged, and so it is a bit of an exploit to use this staff, but... Um, you are able to use the Life Essence whenever you kill an enemy. Life Essence will allow you to cast a Necromancy spell without consuming a spell slot. It's supposed to only work once per enemy killed, but it, it doesn't. It works infinitely. So you can now cast these Inflict Wounds for free if you have the Staff of Cherished Necromancy equipped, not taking any spell slots and spamming these out permanently. You then gain HP every time you kill an enemy, and can cast these from invisibility using greater invisibility, dealing uh, regular critical hits, having advantage on all your attacks because of your high stealth and so on, and also because of your wild magic sorcerer feature if you went that route. For other gear, you're going to want one of the medium armors that has uncapped dexterity usually, although you don't need it because we only have 14 dexterity. But I do also like the gloves of dexterity a lot on this character. It makes you more likely to hit and gives you much better AC. So having that combined with, say, the Yuan-Ti scale mail will give you very high AC in addition to a very, very high chance to hit. 
um, especially given Astarian's bonuses. So those are the items that I recommend, and when you put that all together, you're going to be every single turn dishing out uh, 16d10 of necrotic damage, and you can quicken that for an additional 16d10 of necrotic damage. 32d10 of necrotic damage is, what's that, 100 in... 60-ish damage, um, and that is going to kill most enemies in the game, and of course, anytime you kill an enemy, you gain back a significant portion of your hit points. Alright, my friends, I hope that you've enjoyed this video and this look at Astarian as the true arcane vampire that he was meant to be, and as always, of course, if you have, do feel free to leave a like uh, and comment on the video. I appreciate those things very much because they help with the algorithm, and you can subscribe to this channel for more Baldur's Gate build videos and other strategy game content. Cheers, folks! I'll catch you next time.